<laughs> Back at you. <laughs> My wife tells me I hear what I want to hear sometimes, and I don't always catch everything in faith form, uh, but I did hear something last week about having a soundtrack for the message. And uh, I'm not fully there yet, but I intended to have a walk-up song. They didn't play it. <laughs> but it's never stopped me. I don't think I used the soundtrack right, <laughs> but Neil Diamond's about as close as I get to being with it. <laughs> and after all, with 125 million records worldwide and 56 charted singles and 11 number ones, membership in the Songwriters Hall of Fame, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame with a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, the choice was pretty easy. <laughs> so thanks for sitting through my uh, old man moment. Sweet Caroline, good times never seem so good. I've been inclined to believe they never would. You know what that is? That's called living in the past. I'm inclined they never would. If you'll allow me another old man cranky moment here for just a second, uh, things aren't what they used to be. And in my crankiness, I convinced myself that there were times when God's ways were more obvious, more recognizable, and more visibly successful and victorious. Things aren't what they used to be, and uh, you know what? That's okay, isn't it? I think that's okay. In fact, the assessment that things aren't what they used to be is probably just a figment of my frail perspective that sort of remembers what I want to remember. Isn't that right? I love what Will Rogers, son of Oklahoma, said. Will said things ain't what they used to be and probably never was. <laughs> That's good. But even if things are not as they once were, that's okay. Because one thing is the same at all times, and that is that God is, and Jesus is Lord and King. 479 years ago, next Tuesday, at this time, William Tyndall, bound because he wanted to translate the Bible for his British people, yelled out, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. And after that, he was strangled and burned. Uh, things weren't quite the way Tyndall desired. But what do you do then? You do what you can, where you can, when you can, for as long as you can. And then he prayed, and then he died. Today we're going to start a three-week glimpse into the ministry of Elisha. His mentor Elijah's ministry had been uh, pretty dramatic even if not everybody was Jehovah's worshipers, in fact, few were Jehovah worshipers, Elijah's ministry was dramatic. He had called idolatrous Israel to admit that Jehovah alone was God. In fact, Elijah the name means God is Jehovah. And he did it in public and he did it in dramatic ways like on Mount Carmel when he challenged the prophets of Baal and fire rained from heaven and 450 prophets of Baal who chose against Jehovah died in front in a very public way. And that was just 12 years earlier from where we are now in our text. I'm going to be in, first and, I'm going to be in 2 Kings chapters 1 and 2 here in a second. Now that bold, dramatic outsider of a prophet is going to die off, and he's going to turn, well, actually, he's just going to be taken right to God. That's, that's even better. And he's going to turn the mantle over to the younger, somewhat less certain, less public, less dramatic Elisha. 
And all I want to do this morning is, is pretty simple. Could I just take a little bit of time to say goodbye to the old, that's Elijah, and uh, good luck to the guy that's just getting started, that's Elisha. So let's do that. Let's say goodbye to Elijah. He's going to have one last dramatic outburst for Jehovah from this greatest of old prophets. And you know what? We love times like Elijah's, don't we? I mean, we at least like to read about them, the showdowns. Now, it's not that everybody is a Jehovah worshiper and everyone's on board. In fact, he's in the northern kingdom of Israel, which had been established upon idol worship, calf worship by Jeroboam, so that people would not feel drawn to the south and to the temple and to Jehovah and to the Levitical priests. It's built on idolatry. So it's not that Jehovah worshipers in the north have free reign or government support, but at least Elijah gets to dramatically represent the godly and fight the ungodly, and something about me loves that. I love those times when it's so dramatic and for Jehovah. The king, Ahaziah, son of Ahab and Jezebel, had injured himself, and he wanted to find out from a prophet if he was going to live or die, and so he sent some messengers to the Baal. Let me read it to you, 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 2. Ahaziah fell through the lattice in his upper chamber in Samaria. And he lay sick. So he sent messengers telling them, Go inquire of Baal Zebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall discover from this sick, I shall recover from this sickness. But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, Arise, go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, and say to them, Is it because there's no God in Israel that you're going to inquire of Baal Zebub, the god of Ekron? Now therefore, thus says the Lord, you shall not come down from the bed to which you have gone up, but you shall surely die. Go tell the king, the king who does not worship Jehovah, who consulted with a Baal, go tell him, you shall surely die. The king sent some messengers to Elijah, and they brought back that message, and the king said, what did he look like? And they said, well, he was wearing a garment of hair with a belt of leather around his waist, and the king, I can almost picture him smacking his forehead. Here's what he said. It's Elijah the Tishbite. He's caused trouble for years in this kingdom, standing up for Jehovah, opposing our religions. It's Elijah the Tishbite. But Elijah gets to say to the king, basically, because of your unfaithfulness, you shall die. Back in 2008, my dad found out his cancer was back, and I was with him when the doctor said, uh, you're not going to beat it this time, Bill. This is the one. And so uh, get your affairs in order. And we had three good months together. Uh, part of what I like to do on the weekend is read cards that would come in to Dad. And I would open them up and I'd read them. Then I'd give them to Dad. And we'd, we'd just enjoy the people who had been writing to him. On one day, I, one, one evening when I was there on the couch, I opened up a card I was about to give him. And I wasn't thrilled about turning it over. Here's what it said. I opened it up. Here's what it read. I quote, we are praying for you today. My cousin is dying with the same kind of cancer. End quote. <laughs> Exclamation point. My cousin is dying of the same cancer. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Exclamation point. Are you kidding me? I'm guessing she did not have the gift of encouragement. <laughs> that card could have been signed. You're dying, Elijah the Tishbite. <laughs> Boom. Well, the king sends these units of military men to apprehend Elijah, and two, two units of 50, two different times, 50 men each, go to get Elijah and to force him to come back before the king. He wants to hear from Elijah personally, and both times, look, look uh, verse 9, the king sent him a captain of 50 men with his 50. He went up to Elijah, who was sitting on the top of a hill, and said to him, O man of God, the king says, come down. But Elijah answered the captain of 50, if I'm a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50. Then fire came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50 and a second 50 if I'm a man of God fire from heaven <laughs> I've dreamed I've dreamed through the years that God would act like that again 
I'm just being honest. <laughs> I mean, I'm just being honest with you. Oh, I don't care to call down fire from heaven, but I've often wished, God, why don't you just stand up for yourself that way all the time? Uh, I just want to do it to prove for you, God, who you are to the world. Jehovah is God. I remember watching Madeline Murray O'Hare years ago, well-avowed, well-known atheist, and she was on some talk show. I don't remember who the host was, but she was ranting and raving in her own style about uh, how ridiculous Christians were and how atheism is the only way to go. And, And she's going on and on. And I was just wishing so badly I could just burst upon the stage in that TV room and just yell, in the name of God, nose be gone, boom, no nose. I mean, I don't want to hurt her. I'm Christian enough I didn't want to hurt her. But I, in the name of God, ear to the front of the face, boom, and there's an ear. If I'm a prophet, fire from heaven. By the way, I follow a Lord who probably would go up and touch the ear and move it back to the side of the head and say, enough. But in the name of Jehovah, fire. God does eventually allow Elijah to go. Look at verse 16. That third group is sent. Verse 16, he said to him, thus says the Lord, because you've sent messengers to inquire of Baalzebub, the God of Ekron, is it because there's no God in Israel to inquire of his word? Therefore, you shall not come down from the bed to which you've gone up, but you shall surely die. And verse 17 simply says, so he died according to the word of the Lord. And you know what? I don't want to say much more here except this. At the end of life, Elijah still has it. God is still speaking through him. He is still boldly proclaiming in the name of Jehovah. But in chapter 2, it's time to say goodbye. And Elijah and his protege, Elisha, who have been together for a few years at this point, get to the Jordan River together where they're going to they're cross. They're going to go across the Jordan River. In chapter 2, verse 6, Elijah said to him, Elijah said to Elisha, please stay here for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I won't leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the sons of the prophets who went stood some distance from them as they were both standing by the Jordan. So they're about to cross east out of Canaan proper. Then Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water And the water was parted to the one side and to the other till the two of them could go over on dry ground. These student prophets, these Bible college prophets who had been taught by Elijah and others down through the years, watch Elijah the old prophet and his protege Elisha get to the river and Elijah simply throws down his mantle upon that water and it parts and they walk across. Did you see that? And then they go to the spot where Elijah himself is going to be taken directly by God in that chariot and those horses of fire into the presence of God. And before he goes, he's going to say, Elisha, I'm leaving. Is there anything I can do for you? And Elisha said, all I ask is a double portion of your spirit. Now, double portion, that's legal term in the Old Testament. He really just means I want to be your successor I want, to have your, I want to have your mantle. I want to carry on your ministry. And Elijah said to him, That's, that kind of stuff is for God to decide. But if you see me leave, in other words, Elijah must have known something special was about to happen. But if you see me depart, then you will know it'll be as you've spoken. And suddenly he leaves in that chariot and those horses and it says Elisha looked up and he saw it. And I don't know what he did, but probably something like this. I see it, I see it. And he tears his clothes, takes up some of the clothing of Elijah and heads back west to the river where he's gonna go back in to Canaan. But Elijah's gone. And now the new spokesperson on the scene has some concerns and his concern basically is this. Is God still at work like he was through Elijah. Elisha's on his own. 
He's going to begin his own ministry, and his question is, where is the God of Elijah? Where is the God of Elijah? And he throws down the cloak, and the river spreads, and he comes back into the promised land knowing Elijah may be gone, but God is. And he begins his ministry. Where is the God of Elijah now? That was his question. Have you ever questioned your own worth? Have you ever questioned God's work through you? Have you ever felt just a little bit inexperienced and wondered if God would work through you? Uh, Small churches are fantastic. They're where I feel most comfortable. I like to see some growth in them as they go, and I always enjoy seeing people come to know Jesus, but I just, uh, I just have spent most of my life around small churches. One of the things I got, one of, one of the uh, couples I got to know was an elderly couple down at Racine when I was ministered down there years ago. Their name was John and Ruth. I will never forget, John and Ruth had took part in the Senior Citizens of Seneca, the Seneca Senior Citizens Center. Once a month, they had a potluck dinner where all the senior citizens would get together, bring good food. It was apparently a badge of honor if you got your minister to come with you. So I remember John and Ruth asked if I would accompany them to this monthly Senior Citizens Dinner. I'll never forget walking in with John and Ruth, and Ruth took over, and she's going to introduce me around. I'm standing in a group of senior citizens and their ministers. Here's what happens. I showed up, I'm introduced by her to this circle of senior ministers, and they've already been introduced. This is Reverend Jim Blackburn, this is Pastor Joshua Danley, this is Dr. Gail Wright, and Ruth piped up, here's my little preacher boy, Griff. <laughs> Reverend, doctor, pastor, preacher boy. my. I don't think Elisha's question has anything to do with having a less than stellar title. He has, after all, been chosen by God to be Elijah's successor, so I don't think he's worried about the title necessarily, but I do find him wondering if God will still work. Chapter 2, verse 12, he took hold of his own clothes, tore them in two pieces. He took the cloak of Elijah that had fallen, went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water, saying, and here's his question, where is the Lord? Where is Jehovah, the God of Elijah? And when he struck the water, the water was parted. The answer was, he's still here. Faces may have changed and times may have changed, and as a matter of fact, they might even get momentarily worse, but God still is. And when he gets back to the river, ready to cross back into the land, into the promised land where his work is going to take place in the northern kingdom, the question on his mind is, is God still here and is God at work? And what looked like the worst of times, God still is. God's still there. God works. Now those student prophets who saw Elijah part the river undoubtedly saw Elisha. Verse 15, now when the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho saw him opposite them, they said the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. Notice that they recognized something. And they came to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. Now they still want to find Elijah. They're still drawn to the old but they don't find him, and they begin to turn their attention to Elisha. Now, what can Elisha do? I'll tell you that what Elisha can do. Times may be getting worse. The greatest prophet of all time is now gone. So what can I do? The answer for Elisha is simply that about all he can do is what he can, when he can, where he can, and all he can until he can no longer. To be obedient to whatever Jehovah God gives him to do. He does get to meet, he does get to meet a town that has some physical needs. He can take care of ministering to some people. Look at verse 19. He's gonna make some water healthier. Now the men of the city said to Elisha, behold, the situation of this city is pleasant as my Lord sees, but the water's bad and the land is unfruitful. He said, bring me a new bowl, and he put salt in it. So they brought it to him. Then he went to the spring of water, threw salt in it, and said, thus says the Lord, I have healed this water. From now on, neither death nor miscarriage shall come from it. So the water has been healed to this day. Catch this repeated phrase, with a new name, 
according to the word that Elisha spoke. And he takes care of their physical need for water and nourishment. He meets some young men that that have a spiritual need. They need to be reminded that Jehovah is God and no one else is. And they must respect him and his word. Verse 23, he went up from there to Bethel. And while he was going up the way, some small boys, probably ought to be translated young lads. James Smith says these are ruffians, juvenile delinquents, most likely teenagers. Those nasty teenagers. Viciously mocking the prophet, urging him to join his master in heaven. Some boys came out of the city and jeered him, saying, Go up, you bald head. (laughs) It's repeated, so I'll read it again. Go up, you bald head. (laughs) Come on, it's too easy. Go up, Baldy. More than likely referring to the way Elijah left this earth. Undoubtedly what they had heard, taught about Elijah's disappearance, and they may very well be doing nothing less than saying to this new man of God, it's about time for you to go too. Why don't you disappear, Baldy? The fact that 42 of these I want you to think about this 42. The fact that 42 of these young men are going to get roughed up by a couple of she-bears means there may have been a bunch more. We don't know how big this crowd was. The writer goes out of his way to say 42 of them were torn up by two she-bears. Elisha turned around and saw them, and when he saw them, verse 24, he cursed them in the name of the Lord. And two she-bears came out of the woods and tore 42 of the boys. From there he went on to Mount Carmel, and from there he returned to Samaria. Now, go on up, you baldy. Curse you in the name of Jehovah. And two bears straighten things out. That's classroom management. (laughs) Now, again, in my weaker moments, I've wished to have something similar. I actually uh, caught a student some years back on the back row drawing a little caricature of Griff. (laughs) I would never have thought about bears. Pythons are more my speed. We're not told how brutal this was. We're not told there were any deaths. We are told that 42 learned a lesson about disrespecting God's word through his prophet, Elisha. I do, it's, it's not quite as dramatic, by the way, as fire from heaven. But I do find it interesting that after this somewhat lesser demonstration compared to Carmel, where his predecessor called down fire, I find it interesting that the first place he runs to is Carmel, where his master demanded that people choose between Jehovah and Baal. Eventually, Elisha is going to settle in the capital city of Samaria. He's not going to be like his predecessor who lived in the wilderness, wore rough clothing, and had an ascetic lifestyle. He's going to move into the capital city of Samaria and have access to kings and military men. And he's going to be a little bit more of a city fellow. But for six decades, he's going to do his work for God. Bob Whitty and John Kerr are going to take us farther into Elisha's life. I just wanted us to say to him, good luck as you start. His miracles are going to get more dramatic, including a resurrection. But for now, he does what he can, where he can, when he can, and for as long as he can.
whether you and I are saying goodbye to the old or good luck to the new, whether times are like they've always been or times are different, our obligation remains the same. It is to carry out ministry like the ministry of Jesus which, by the way, was quite a bit like the ministry of Elisha in some ways, helping with the physical, teaching about the spiritual. And I know I, I, don't, like that, I don't like that distinction either, but you get my point. Jesus, who told John the Baptist when John said, you know what, you're, you're not quite the bonfire that I prophesied, are you the one? Luke 7, Jesus said, go back and tell John, the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the dead fear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. You got the physical. You got the spiritual. He sent out his 12 in Luke 9 and did it for two reasons, to proclaim the kingdom of God, that's his word, his rule, to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. And we do so, caring for people in the name of Jesus and proclaiming the spiritual truth that Jehovah has revealed. And we do that, waiting for the day when the Creator has His way. Pull a dwelt. Did you hear that? Waiting for the day when the Creator has His way and everything is made brand new. Oh, we got glimpses now of needs being met. But one day the Creator is going to have His way. Everything will be brand new. This past Easter Sunday, Easter Sunday of this year, I sat in the back of an auditorium where about 300 or so elementary age kids <laughs> waited on our children's minister, Brianne Stevens to give instructions about the Easter egg hunt that would follow out in our parking lot. I sat in the back because I didn't want to get trampled. <laughs> Brianne gave instructions to what I thought was a tough, tough crowd. They just wanted to get out of there, but she held her attention pretty well. And then Brianne concluded words, but it doesn't matter. She had reminded me that the resurrection of Jesus is a dramatic reminder that someday the Creator will have His way. Jehovah is God. Jesus is king. Maybe things aren't what they used to be, or just maybe things are just like they've always been. And either way, this is true. God one day will make all things right, and all you and I can do in the meantime is what we can, where we can, when we can, for as long as we can. And as we do, aren't you glad that if the question is, where is the God of Elijah, the answer still is, seated on high on his throne and still working his plan through his people here on earth. Now to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen.